Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 810th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the huge pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation featuring Marilyn Minter, Ksenia M. Sobaliva, and Andrew Wilbright. We're also thrilled to welcome writer Drew Ziba here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. <laughs> And now to introduce today's guest and hosts. Marilyn Minter is an artist based in New York. Her work has been the subject of many solo exhibitions. From 2015 through 2017, her retrospective Marilyn Minter Pretty Dirty traveled to the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, the Orange County Museum of Art and the Brooklyn Museum. Minter is represented by LGDR, Reagan Projects, Lehman Maupin, and Baldwin Gallery. New York-based writer and art historian Dr. Ksenia M. Sobaliva specializes in queer art and culture. Her writings have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Bomb, Hyperallergic, Art Agenda, and various exhibition catalogs. She's currently the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender and LGBTQ Plus History at the New York Historical Society and an adjunct professor of art history at NYU. And artist, curator, and critic Andrew Woolbright is based in Brooklyn. He is an MFA graduate from RISD Painting. Woolbright is the founder and director of the gallery Below Grand on the Lower East Side. In addition to curating, he's an editor at large at the Brooklyn Rail, and he currently teaches at the School of Visual Arts and at Pratt Institute. We're so, so thrilled to have you all here in conversation today. And it's with my pleasure, I'll pass it over to Ksenia and Andrew. Thank you so much, Eleanor. And thank you to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail uh, for making this possible as always. Um, Andrew, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll kick it off. Absolutely. Uh, Marilyn, congratulations on your show. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, I, uh, you know, your work to me has such a, an ASMR quality where it prompts this very sensory bodily experience. And I want to talk about that more. But actually, this, the question that I wanted to start with is um, it struck me when reading the press release that this body of work is uh, presented as your uh, debut uh, to portraiture, at, at least in painting. And uh, I was surprised by that because to me, your work has always existed somehow in the realm of portraiture, you know, even if it's just the close up of someone's mouth or someone's vagina, to me, that is still, uh, you know, I associate that with portraiture. So my first question for you is, what do you understand portraiture to be? And how was this um, in some way a move away from, from your earlier practice? Uh, that's a good question. It is just, I, I think it was just this really uh, natural progression, really organic. I, I was thinking about who paints portraits, who, who, um, who owns portraits all through art history. Are there any women portrait painters? And what would that look like? And for me, uh, since I work with Photoshop so much, I thought I'd try it out. I thought I'd just see if I could. Uh, I'm thinking more of, uh, uh, in terms of when I was doing it, when I was shooting, when I was, I wanted to get uh, the personality of, of the uh, sitter, but also um, I wanted to make primary, my primary purpose was to make a good painting, a good looking painting. And I was thinking of, you know, Cezanne's portraits, you know, they were really just good looking paintings. And, uh, so that was my primary objective. And then the second one was to see if it could, if I could get that personality. So like I, I shot Roxane Gay and, and I, I, sh I shoot so much when, and I'm shooting behind um, a screen. 
so that I can I can get distortion that way. And um, and yeah, there's Roxanne, and I wanted her side eye because that's what she kept you know doing, giving me that side eye. And uh, and then she doesn't even know I could see it because she's behind glass that's all wet and steamy. So I think I you know people let down their guard. Everyone does because they don't think I can see them. And even though intellectually they know I can, uh, but they don't, they can't see me. So they assume that no one can see them. And that's been uh, my trick to get people's personalities. So, I didn't realize they couldn't see you. Pardon me? I didn't realize they couldn't see you. They can't see me. Yeah, yeah. Like I got Gaga when she was, I mean, Gaga does not, she controls her image at all times. So when I shot her, I got her where she wasn't paying any attention. Mm. Since we're already getting into images, um, I want to come at things uh, with you, Marilyn, from like a John Kelsey kind of standpoint, where I'm interested in um, how you're able to, I love that you included images on dye sublimation prints and then also paintings. And there's this really great back and forth between images in the raw state and then the choice to paint them. And I'm wondering, uh, I have two questions for you. One, are, do you have any limits to your editing process in Photoshop or anything that you're thinking of? Or is it something that you feel image to image? And then also um, how you're thinking about bringing what what stays an image and what gets turned into enamel on panel for you usually the uh if it's a perfect image i mean sometimes you know i'm in the zone when i'm shooting so i'm not really sometimes i don't even know what i shot you know until i edit and uh if it's like perfect why would i paint it <laughs> yeah. yeah oh sorry i, I missed that was there a question? Did you say something? Oh, yeah. Else? Oh no, no, I, 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 I didn't. Um, I just, uh, what, what makes a perfect image for you, or is that harder? That to I don't have to do anything to it. Hmm. You know, if I don't have to do anything to it, then I just make it a photo. But it's so rare. So, <laughs> and you know, and and I mean, I had really four photos in the whole show. I had four new photos all year. You know, so they're mostly all the paintings are multiple images and they're constantly, you know, changing constantly. So the first there's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I don't know what the painting is going to look like until I start putting a layer of paint on the metal. Hmm. And uh, why? And then I get that first layer down from the first, uh, usually the first uh reference we call it this is like there, there's like 30 or 40 different images in this picture this in this mm -hmm. odalesque of jasmine wahi and um and then i'll start painting it and then the hand looks so bad and the phone looks so bad i took images from other phones other hands um i you know it's it's uh, it's like, I don't know, Once I, I can draw. I've always been able to draw. Once I learned Photoshop, I thought, God, this is so much easier. So I just started playing around in Photoshop, getting exactly, it was really about trying to get what was in my mind's eye uh, or an image of it, although you never can. One, I can't anyway. So I must have painted that shoe and that hand 20 times mm. until it finally worked. Marilyn, since we were just looking at the fountains, um, another question that I had was, you know, you were just speaking about who makes portraits. It's usually men making portraits. There's very few women making portraits of women. But the thing with fountains is too, when, when I think about who has made fountains, it's Duchamp, it's Bruce Nauman, uh, lots of male artists um, who tapped into this medium of the fountain. What made you, what made you decide to to include this sculptural element to turn to the fountain? Uh, it was a convoluted, like everything really. Um, I, I really don't sit there. And, I'm not an intellectual, I'm totally intuitive. And I made uh, this car with, with this gentleman, Larry Wash, who, um, who uh, commissions artists to, to, he, to make a car like Richard Prince and Hugo Rondioni. And, but he started, he's really young. He started with Keith Haring 
and uh, and uh, Kenny Sharf. So he said, uh, you know, we'll pay you this amount of money and then we'll we'll produce the the car, we'll buy the car and you can do whatever you want with it. So I thought I already had this video of uh, green pink caviar that I made a million years ago. And I thought, oh, well, you know, what, what do we forget? Um, you can see it on YouTube, green pink caviar. I thought, well, it would make sense to put it in, uh, you know, everybody in, when I was growing up would make out in cars. So I already had this image of lips uh, moving around uh, candy, playing with candy. So I didn't even have to shoot a new video because I wasn't really thinking, I mean, I made this car 15 years ago, um, but it looked good. I, we got a pacer, which is my husband found it uh, uh, on, uh, I don't know, Craigslist or something. And they bought the Pacer and Pacer had giant windows back in the seventies, I think it was. And uh, so it was rusted out and they took, we took the motor out and we made this uh, car um, uh, with green pink caviar, the mouse um, uh, lapping up uh, candy. So it was like such an easy thing to do when we chromed the car, of course it doesn't run. But, uh, and I showed it in Westport, Connecticut at the MOCA there. And my dealer said, why don't you make another object? I thought, that's a good idea. You know, why don't I? And uh, so then I thought, well, I, you know, work with water so much and screens. Why don't I, uh, I thought, okay, I'll make a drinking fountain that uh, the image comes from turning the bubble, that's what they call it when, when you press that button, it's a bubbler. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, um, uh, I'll have the image, I don't know, somehow I thought I could spray the bubbler and the, and the uh, image could come out when, when, when the water came out, the image would just be on the water. But that meant it had to be an outside projector. So that didn't work. So we just kept playing. Like, how can we do something? How can we make an object? So I thought, well, let, you know, let's do the basin, you know, so that way we could project from the inside of the projector. I mean, of the of the uh, container. And uh, so it's all this unit. So we made all this, like what you're looking at right now is a prototype. So I made the video first and it was just, you know, all these people that I'm interested in, people I've been working with, like, this is a, a model I've worked with for the last 10 years, uh, Sleepy Angel on Instagram. And uh, I never know how she's going to show up. So she kind of showed up that day with uh, braids and braces. So I was, you know, I like whatever anyone brings to me. So um, she was lapping up candy. And then I have two trance models. And one of them is my assistant uh, had a, uh, uh, the other were, were just people that work for me <laughs> who, you know, had nothing else to do. And I said, well, let, let, lap up this candy. And so we just put this video together and it looked, we called it thirsty. And then we figured out different ways to project it. And we finally uh, worked with Walla Walla, the um, uh, foundry in Washington. And they made these um, all in one, uh, you know, we don't even, you don't even need plumbing. Because it it, care, it holds three and a half gallons, so you don't even have to put water in it. You can put wine in it, and mm -hmm. uh, and it, the, and the bat and the uh, projection runs on a battery. So it was just we made these because we had no plumbing on every floor in the gallery. So, but we were retrofitting them now. When people want to buy them, it's too much work to uh, charge the uh, image to charge the. Uh, uh, video. So um, now we're just, we're making, we're retrofitting plugins mm. and plumbing. I know this is kind of technical, but um, we're making it so you could do both. So we're making the next, the rest of the fountains are going to be dual. If that makes any sense. Now, why did I make it? And what did, I, what was I thinking? Who knows? <laughs> I'd like to know that myself, but it made I mean, total sense to me. Yeah. Like You are pulling in her. something. Um, you know, like car culture, like historically, what are men obsessed with? Sex, cars, um, you know, so I do think that there's that there's an interesting feminist uh, statement there as well. Yeah, I'm, you know, that's why I love writers, you know, because they <laughs> explain to me what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm interested, Marilyn, in this process. For me, this was the, the thing that most literally engaged with your take on the bathers, where like the water became this like this kind of protective thing. But then the water fountain is also like something you literally are kind of consuming the image. Uh, I'm wondering at what point. That's what I was uh, thinking, bathers... consuming the image. That's exactly what I was thinking, eating the image, drinking the image. Yeah. For, for me, I, this is like thought. the the ages or the the telltale heart of the show and that motif of the bathers. But I'm wondering when bathers kind of as this unifying architecture of the show came in for you, like when you started thinking about running with that, because that appeared in the essay that accompanied the show. Well, the bathers, um, I was just looking at art history and I thought mm -hmm. to myself, I, I couldn't find women painting other women grooming. I could only find men painting women. Uh, and they're always, uh, and I have no problem with this, but there was a, a level, there was a layer in there of, well, they're always, you know, a way to show tits and ass all through art history because there was no photography. And, I, you know, there's always a breast exposed, you know. Uh, the, the Apollo, I just use it as Apollo uh, surprising Daphne in this at the stream. And it was just a way to show sexy ladies, you know, which is, I have no problem with. I like to look at beautiful women too. And I thought, well, does, and I still don't know the answer. And maybe you could tell me, but I just wanted to uh, see what it looked like if uh, uh, women painted other women. What does that look like? What does that look like? We have all those Degas, we have all those Matisses, we have the Odalesques, we have, we have, you know, from first paintings, you know, uh, Venus, you know, rising, uh, the very earliest paintings and uh, of women grooming or women being surprised in the stream or women combing their hair or, and I, and I just thought, why don't women, what, what does it look like when women paint other women grooming? And that's where the bathers came in. And so I was using people I knew like Jasmine, she's one of She's a, a model of mine because she's so luscious, you know. And I was looking for unconventional beauty too. But I was working with a lot of punks. But I started with um, I started with the pre-Raphaelites in the very last uh, room. I think you have them. Uh, the I, I was thinking of uh, you know the Lizzie Sedell and uh, the the pre-Raphaelites worked with these women. Uh, grooming, combing their hair and uh, being, you know, Ophelia. And uh, so that's why I, I had this model who uh, die, who didn't dye her hair, but put a red rinse on it. And she was a really lush model. And um, that's how I began. And I made these three or four or five paintings. And this one took me three years. Um, I really should. It was so many different variations, but um, I finally ended, I call it Lilith because it almost killed me. <laughs> and uh, I, I taught myself how to paint, you know, uh, a, a good a good looking painting in steam and water, basically, and how I could chart the eye mm -hmm. with this steam and this water, make a good looking, because I'm really still... Uh, I, you know, seduced but by uh, desire. I want you to want to look at the image. I want you to get pleasure out of looking at the image. And I loved the reflections and, and the, what the drips did in the steam. And it was a way for me to work in metaphor. Mm -hmm. And did you use the shower because, you know, it is this space, it is this intimate private space that has the screen? Whereas a bathtub, you know, has either a curtain, but very rarely do you have that sort of glass partition uh, with a bath. Well, I, didn't, I needed the glass to make it yeah. 21st century. Yeah. Because I wanted it to be really clear 21st century. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you never see women painting, uh, you never saw men even paint women in the shower. So it was a way for me to create a uh, distortion and make it more a more interesting image to me rather than just a picture of a woman in the shower. But I'm fascinated by, I love, I've always loved rain. I mean, even when I was a little girl, I lived, grew up in Florida and it rained every day at two o'clock. You know, I just was sitting in the car, look, watching the rain uh, 
fall on the screen and then the car would get all steamed up. So these are things that have always fascinated me. And it's a way to slow everything down, mm -hmm. to have a screen, to, to be able to manipulate uh, what part of the image comes through, what part. It was almost, you know, abstracting the image so that it doesn't tell you every single detail. It's not an illustration that way. Mm -hmm. I'm getting towards that, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, getting into that idea of slowing the image down with these paintings that sometimes take three years, I'm wondering where your satisfaction comes in, Marilyn. Do you enjoy being the editor, the editing process in Photoshop or painting more? Or well, are they both really kind of- Both. I mean, I'm at, we're in the zone when we, I work with two really, I mean, I learned Photoshop, but, you know, I, my last, I mean, you know, creative, uh, I think I, I stopped at five. <laughs> you know, I get these kids right out of school and they're like, you know, wipe the floor with all of us. You know, they learn all the new uh, filters and techniques. And so that's so much fun working in Photoshop. And then, uh, but the hard part is making the painting. I can't tell you how many images I've had of Gaga or really all of them. The only one that really came out, the only one that didn't give me any trouble. Oh yeah, this was two different paintings entirely. The only one that didn't torture me to death was Micheline. That was one of the easiest shoots I've ever had. I could have made four or five paintings. That was just magical how easy she was to, uh, to, to, to make an image of. She mm -hmm. just gave me so much information. And uh, and then the artist. It was a torture, <clears throat> Glenn Ligon. He was, he, he came out in a million, I mean, I had a, three or four different paintings of him. God got two, but the uh, Roxanne was pretty easy too. Those two really made it easy. Gloria was impossible. I, I, only because she's an icon to me, of course. But I think, you know, she doesn't wear makeup. And I needed I needed something to chart the eye, some kind of, you know, decorative element even. So, I, I, so she did bring a scarf. She only wears black. And she had kind of interesting glasses. So mm -hmm. I tried to, I, I, and I tried to get her, I don't think you might have a close up. There's Glenn, yeah. I, that ring was everything for me. The ring, the glasses, her eyes, they were so startlingly clean and clear. And she was so confident. And uh, uh, so I finally got her, but it was not easy. It was a torture. Mm -hmm. I felt really, I'm really proud of all of them, but they were so hard to do. I, was, I could see why now uh, people don't pay portraits. <laughs> I want to ask mm -hmm. you about your process of, of inviting your speakers. But before that, actually, it, it is an interesting paradox, right? That these are bathers, but they're wearing their clothes. They have their sunglasses on. They have jewelry. Like, was that a conscious? Um, well, in my brain, I was thinking, I know this sounds crazy, but, you know, that they're, they're just sitting in a restaurant and it's a wet, rainy day out. Okay. You know, I got... Uh, 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 that's like my, the possibility of why they were all under glass and, mm. and that was by way of distortion you know because that was it really and then I was thinking of the spa when right. I was doing Lizzo I was thinking of a spa and I wanted to start making these odalesques and she was my uh, Jasmine was my first one Lizzo I'm making a big painting of her which is really a beauty I love this painting but it's going to be another year this is a photo I made of her because uh, I just for sitting to sit for me. She she uh, demanded a photo, so I, I but she was so easy to shoot. She was another one that was just I don't know. Some people are really difficult. Some people are so hard, but she was really easy. Like an hour, I had I had the image twenty minutes into mm -hmm. the shoot. Cool. Um, how are you thinking about like flesh versus skin, uh, Marilyn, when you're painting this? Are you actively thinking about it? There are moments in the big show time. where big time. there's, there's oh, a moment God. where they, they're obsessed with they, flesh. <laughs> well, how, how are you thinking about it? Because there's a real range. There are moments where it, it it's getting kind of this cultivated desire of like fashion airbrushing. 
But then there are moments where you're using the enamel to really like dapple the skin like a an ang before the last the last uh, uh, varnish or or vermeer. I'm wondering how you're choosing and thinking about like flesh, or is it just situation to situation? Well, I know I'm crazed with this. This is one of my obsessions. I go, you know, I go to. Uh, I just wanted to see uh, the Titians, uh, you know, in Boston. I drove up there to see the flesh. Uh, truthfully, I think enamel, you can make flesh better any, than any other kind of paint because um, mm. you can get a depth uh, and a richness because they're translucent layers of enamel. And there's many, 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 many layers. These are all photos, by the way. This has nothing to do with my show, honestly. <laughs> this is another project entirely, but... Uh, which is a really interesting we, subject. We should probably could take we maybe go down. yeah. Could we maybe go back to the sec, the paintings that are on the second floor that really show off that skin? I think it's fourteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 15, this is important. Yeah. Yeah. Thir 13, 14, 15. Yeah, yeah like the, is, these up close, you have to see them for all of you who haven't made it to the show that it really particleizes that in animal. In you know, it's so way. painful for a painter to to realize that everybody, your age group, everyone out here is really only seeing digital all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know, I know it's so painful for a painter. Is that a painting or a photo? I'm thinking, oh my God, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got yeah. 20 layers there to get that depth, you know. There's, mm -hmm. there's, greens in there you know in that skin there's uh uh there's magentas there's just colors that are to create this finished product it's almost like an old-fashioned renaissance painter with the layers so it, it, and it takes so long to do and it's really just dismissed i mean i i it, but there's nothing i can do about it because this is also progress but i'm really an old-fashioned painter <clears throat> these really communicated that for me where oh, i was thinking you. of like that only that, other uh, painters i i yeah. read that you're a painter an artist and of course mariana told me i thought oh good because an artist can see it <laughs> only yeah. another painter knows though well, well there's that beautiful i mean maybe you have the same yeah i went back to renaissance with these and thought of like that that grisaille of the odely by ang that the met has and carrie Aang james marshall showed sister. yeah totally yeah and and that 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 last layer before you do the final glaze that kind of unifies all of it i think is like the most beautiful layer and i i took these to be that kind of that's exactly what they are, you know, in yeah. the 21st century. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Marilyn, yeah. how do you choose your sitters? Are they, some of them are character. Like this is a young punk covered in tattoos. Mm -hmm. I actually erased most of the tattoos. <laughs> they're, they're people that with character. You know, I get a lot of them through my best friend. One of my best friends is Ryan McGinley. And he got, you know, he works commercially and he has, oh my God, he has this great group of models and uh, all different sizes, shapes, colors. And I just ask him for, I tell him this is what I'm looking for. And then he gives me a, a, a 10 people. So that's really it. I just did, you know, and then I see people on the Instagram. I've seen two of my models I just found on Instagram, which I really am not a, a real member of I look at uh, I don't have follow anybody but I look at uh, I, I look at it a little bit to look for people mm. and so um, I, I mean I post all the time so it's not true but I'm already a Twitter junkie and I couldn't have two <laughs> I couldn't have two social media uh, because it's too much time I like to read I love to read so what I can't do both Mm -hmm. Twitter, Instagram, I'm fuck Facebook, but you know, <laughs> Facebook. I don't have TikTok. Yeah, it's too too dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that maybe I was healthier and happier when before I even got on social media. I think we all were. Yeah, because I was much happier reading. Yeah. Now I'm reading, and I think, well, I haven't looked at my phone in oh, I don't know, an hour or two. <laughs> I don't want to be that person. Yeah, I think that I've 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 read. I don't know if you're gonna like hearing that, but I've read your work uh, 
be referred to as as a very uh like instagram filter e yeah you heard that before how do you feel about that because oh. you, you love digital media <laughs> you know it's once i swear to you once it leaves the studio it's a different animal i don't own it anymore yeah and i want you to have different readings i want people to say all kinds of things i don't want it to be this prescribed thing i really believe in tolerance you know of uh of, of, of complexity. Mm -hmm. I, I want there to, I don't believe there is anything black and white. Yeah. Anything about anything. And so I don't want it to be easy. I mean, what, what's the, I always say this to my students, what's the last movie? And I'm asking, I'll ask you, Ksenia, what's mm -hmm. the last movie you saw that you really liked and talked about and thought about? Um, Oh my God, it was a Metrograph. It was a French film from the late 80s, uh, French director, Eric Rumer. Yeah, uh, Romer, yeah. Romer, and it was called Rayon uh, uh, Vert. It was The Green Ray. Yeah, I didn't see that one, but I bet you anything, it doesn't give you the answers on a platter. Things you have to think about. Things you oh this is where it gets interesting for me when I look at art in other forms books trust did, you, did anyone read trust the book it won the Pulitzer just this year I mean there's so many ways to read that book mm -hmm. and that's sort of what I'm trying to do in painting what's it look like to look what's it feel like to look what's it feel like yeah. Yeah, one thing that I that I have to ask you though, you know, because so many of your sitters are celebrities, a lot of viewers are coming into a show with already their assumptions are about the people that they're looking at. And for me, there is this ambiguity whether like are you idealizing these people or are you critiquing celebrity culture? Where well, they're not celebrities unless you're an artist. Lady Gaga? Yeah. Oh, except for Lady Gaga. Yeah. Lizzo? Lizzo? Uh, there's no, Gay? No. Yeah, there's the celebrities for sure. But I started with just people, you know, like uh, Mary Margaret. She's in, uh, she's at Liam Min Mopin. But there, you know, I started, and artists are, we're a tiny fraction, you know. Um, uh, that's true. Uh, Michelin, nobody knows who Michelin is and then they're in the art world or Glenn, or I'm doing Cindy, you know, they wouldn't even know who it is. I want to do, you know, how my next, uh, what I'm trying like crazy to shoot next is E. Jean Carroll. I like to shoot people that the culture took apart and then second guess what they're. Well, Monica Lewinsky is definitely. She was that. perfect. I, I, people that I'm interested in are, uh, <clears throat> I'm not interested in painting rich people as a commission. I want to paint people I admire. Then I have a lot of fun painting. I think, I think too, like something I was thinking of going off of Ksenia's point is there's something about the, the people you're choosing except for Nicolene that there's something like overproduced about them as an image or like overdetermined or Monica is like flattened out by culture and like uh, Lady Gaga is there's an attempt to flatten her but she's trying to the, the thing I really liked about the Lady Gaga portrait mm -hmm. is for me that reminded me of that Titian painting of the cardinal behind the veil like half the painting is veiled and half of it isn't I like that that stroke of light and I think that there is something like maybe I don't know how you feel about it, but something about production and lighting that's like kind of a Hollywood, it implies a Hollywood budget or like a fashion, fashion shoot budget yeah. that you're, you're reframing or recontextualizing or dealing with. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. It's my way of mm -hmm. giving you some mystery. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's just, I don't know, an illustration. You know, I mean, I'm still working in the language of painting mm -hmm. and every, and the history of art is behind every brushstroke, really. Mm -hmm. So this is the only language I know. I know it pretty well yeah. and I'm comfortable in it. I, um, you know, I want to, I, 
And I want to pay people I'm really interested in. I want to pay, you know, uh, well, artists. I'm, I just shot Nick Cave and I didn't know he was going to start dancing in his seat, you know, and he did. And so I've got his hands dancing, you know, that's like, mm -hmm. I want them all to be Franz Hall portraits, mm -hmm. not, oh. not, uh, uh, the cardinal <laughs> or the king or or obama you know mm -hmm. well how much direction are you giving the models if anything are you letting them like nick cave let them do it. yeah i let yeah. i let them get comfortable look good feel good bring what you got i don't give them any direction i do have one request for my one of my next artists i'm doing bob gober too that's great. I have one request, but I don't know if the artist will do it, but I'm going to ask for something. I want this artist to hold one of his objects. Um, but let's see if he does it or not. So are these celebrities maybe and only in the art world? But these are people I admire. They changed art history, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Marilyn, another theme uh, that you're very committed to that is perhaps a little less present in the show, but I know that you also have a book coming out or it's out already, um, which which uh, centers the, the issue of ageism. Yeah, exactly. That was those photographs before. I got commissioned by the New York Times uh, to write, to write, to photograph. The writer was Maggie Jones, who, was, who did this study, so interesting about sexuality at aging, which is another, and they asked me, of course, because I seem to zero in on contemptible, dismissive subject matter. And the people that usually have a lot of uh, contempt for, I don't know, the base subject matter, what old, uh, old people fucking is horrifying, you know, to people and the pictures of them, uh, you know, in their mind's eye are, are uh, contempt, just pure contempt. And what this, article found out is that people are happy and uh they well she interviewed a, a many many people and um and couples that have been married 50 years they talk about having the best sex of their lives in their 80s and that was like stunning here that woman is 89 she's 89 years old and uh uh and so i wanted to at the, well, here's what I learned from the article first, that nobody's ever aged this healthily before. Like you guys are going to be live to about 120. You know, uh, I, I think those are the statistics. And uh, they like 70 year olds have never been this healthy. 80 years old have never been this healthy. There's never been Viagra before. There's never been sex toys before. So these people are having a ball. <laughs> you got to read the article. So they asked me to illustrate uh, 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 the article, basically. So I was, we were looking, all my subject matters were, were between the ages of 70 and 90. And um, you can show them all now if you want to. So I have, so it's the New York, oh, this is a couple. This is a couple. Do you know Dan Colin, the artist? That's his parents. Oh. Yeah, I, I did get two couples. Mm -hmm. And because um, I asked all my friends, not every one of them turned me down. And the woman you just saw uh, the last picture, she was the mother of one of the editors. Yeah, she's the mother of one of the editors at the New York Times. That's because that, we had to go around begging people to pose for us. And what people don't know is, first of all, they enjoy sex and don't care what they look like. But this is the part that was really stunning to every. No one's photographed old people in intimate pictures. Or they have, I don't know about them. I know artists that have photographed themselves as they are older, but not couples or not, you know, uh, or, or, or they're like a fetish, a sexual mm -hmm. fetish, uh, like ugly grannies, you know, on, on, on Pornhub or something. So I wanted to see affection and love. I wanted to see a picture of uh, elegance too. So we had all different races and all different colors. And uh, I just shot different people, but most of them are models. I mean, actors, models look are too perfect. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, these are actors. And they were, you know, they, a lot of them, there were two couples. There were actually two couples. But a lot of the pictures I couldn't, uh, the Times can't show them. They couldn't show the sex toys. Who knew you? there were male vibrators? Did you know that? There are male vibrators? And then I, I, I live upstate. So, I mean, I live upstate on weekends. I live in the city. I went to Walmart and there they were <laughs> at Walmart. And I thought, wow. So that wasn't around 50 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe not even 10 years ago. So um, that was the next thing I learned. And then the, the uh, biggest shock was how good people look from their neck to their the beginning of their legs, women and men. Look at her breasts. That's an eighty nine year old breasts, and like this is stunning because it shows your age and your arms. I'm sorry, your armpits, your neck, and your hands. But women wear bathing suits all the time, or even their backs. If there's some, maybe some pictures in here of backs, they look too young. When we were editing, the editor. I kept saying, no, that looks too young. That looks too young. No one's going to believe these people are 80, 90 years old. Mm. And uh, it's true. So that's another thing I learned. That was a shock. And uh, I, and even the model, I had to talk. I said, look, so we're being pioneers here. We're giving people permission. We're giving, let them pe- get permission. And of course, the Times couldn't show any of the sex toys. And they couldn't because it's a family magazine. And they couldn't show anything too erotic so I had all these pictures they didn't use and I thought what a waste you know and so um we talked to a publisher who said let's make a book so we did it Mm -hmm. and there's actually a uh a book party elder sex uh next Friday at uh my gallery LGDR we're just we're and release releasing the book and these are some of the pictures and I just wanted to um I want I wanted to be the first one that shot these people in any kind of sexual uh I didn't even want to be the first. I like the idea that they asked me. I wasn't thinking about it. It never even occurred to me to think about it until I was asked to do this. And then I had so many good pictures. Like this one couldn't even be in the New York Times. So why not make a book, right? Yeah. Do you imagine that you might turn to this topic in painting as well? I did do this topic in painting maybe 15 years ago. And my model was uh, Michelle LeMay. You know who that is? Yes, I do. Yeah, and uh, and everyone hated it, <laughs> including my dealers. <laughs> I saw some beautiful paintings of her. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah even, even that surprise that the bodies look too young reveals the ageism, right? And I, I've actually, I've been catching myself saying when somebody is like, oh, I'm 65. And when I say, oh, you look so good. And then I'm like, wait, oh, why did I do that? Like, so yeah, why yeah. wouldn't they look good? Yeah. 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 Why wouldn't How, are How are you going to age? We don't know. Like, remember when people just took Madonna apart after being on that? Was it a VM? I don't know what the um grammys was that was what she was on and yeah. they they made and also made, down at basel too yeah i yeah. mean how do you age how do you age as a rock star yeah or i mean my favorite celebrity couple sarah paulson holland taylor and they get so much shit you know uh, yeah so much shit why well, that's where uh, my interest lies as you can see that second guessing this knee-jerk reactions we have and that's what all my subjects really are about. I don't know, it's, whether it's pornography or um, ah, what else is it? Fashion, it's contemptible, right? Shallow, you know? But it's, you know, it's a giant engine of the culture. It's a billion, billion dollar engine of the culture. It seems to me is fashion and glamour. There's, at the same time, you know, all, there's, all these editors that are female, they're the bosses. They're the, that's where women really have power. At the same time, there's horrible body dysmorphia and uh, and, self, and self-hatred because you know you're not gonna look. Why can't we have all of that in the same image? Mm-hmm. And that for me is where the interest lies. It's easy to dismiss these things. So I'm interested in what's easily dismissed. Why can't we look at that again? 
Why is that that uh, we have these? Why do we hate the Kardashians in the art world? Why are they so contemptible? You know, how many 21 year old billionaires do you know? Hmm. Yeah. But does anyone funny. know the Kardashians? No, of course not. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Why do we hate women, successful women? No matter what, you know, if they work in terms of uh, the way they look, because we're commodified so much, the male gaze, the whole, why is, you know, if they make a living by the way they look, what the fuck, why not? You know, we're, how many other avenues do we have to have power? Well, it does yeah. seem to be a consistent motif Marilyn, maybe, I don't know how you feel comfortable with it, is is this reversal of the public and the private or like, you know, the the people late age love and eroticism is is taking something private, making it very public. There's Monica, Monica Lewinsky, who's kind of dragged into the public, you know, and like the Kardashians are people like Ksenia brought up that maybe don't even have a private. It's entirely yeah, public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems to be this like interest in some type of reversal or like Nicolene Thomas even is, is, you know, creating and cultivating a public through her art. There seems to be that sensitivity to someone trying to control it versus being out of control of it. Well, that's, that's, that's my question. That's what we should be. I think these are the things that we should be looking at all the time. Why do we have these knee jerk reactions, this automatic contempt? It's just too easy. There's got, there's it's, everything's so much more complex. We're always looking for categorizing and black and making things either black or white. And, uh, and I'm just always saying, let's tolerate the complexity here. It's not that easy. Sometimes there's no answers at all. But, but okay. my first reaction is always that um, the more we examine things, the like things that are considered private, I think in a way it's like the sunlight is a disinfectant. Completely. Well, yeah. it's interesting that it it kind of triggers the uncanny when we get a sense that someone doesn't have a private, you know, yeah. Warhol is allowed to do it. But when, you know, I too am like the Kardashians that, that I'm conditioned to be like, I don't trust that, that I don't think they have a private, it's all public. Yeah. And the work they is kind of- Not human, yeah. Yeah. And that's where I get in a lot of trouble, you know? I mean, the fact that, a lot of trouble, I mean, uh, the gatekeepers are really offended by the fact that I work with glamor and beauty and mm -hmm. and pornography and... And yeah, I, how, why do we, I, we go, that's where I'm interested. That's what I'm interested in. Can, can we go back to that issue of pornography? Because I feel like um, you were, very early on kind of bringing pornography into your work when uh, it was definitely considered you should, that was not art or that was adjacent to art. And I, how did, how Trader was that? Feminism. Yeah, the same time I was working at Clinic Defense for Planned Parenthood. <laughs> yeah, right. Feminism. Well, I didn't know that, um, that body of work, I really, I know it's, I know it sounds disingenuous, but I was a, 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 a number of, I was in this pro-sex feminist group and it was really run by gay and lesbian people. And uh, I was maybe the only heterosexual and we, and we were studying, you know, uh, Candida Royale and Susie Bright and all these, um, uh, they were, you know, controversial subjects. We're talking the eighties here. Uh, of making and producing sexual imagery for their own pleasure and amusement. And I thought everyone thought like I did. <laughs> and uh, um, and so I thought, well, you know, what does that look like if a woman makes hardcore porn, makes pictures of it? And, um, and why I got uh, excoriated is because I didn't have answers. Because I don't know what is the female gaze? What is the male gaze? I mean, there's still people. I'm on a panel discussion next week called Reclaiming the Gaze. Don't, can't we just make our own gaze? Do we have to reclaim it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know these answers. So when I did the hardcore porn, I thought, does it change the meaning? And 
I, there, there, I still have totally unanswered questions about that. Like I'm an old lady, so I could do anything. Me and Judy Bernstein were talking about that. But when we were young and I was young enough that I got criticized for being a female, a traitor to sexism, to, fi to feminism, because uh -huh. I was young. Now, you know, and I always use this metaphor, well, not metaphor, but it's just, I think about Louise Bourgeois holding that very famous Robert Maplethorpe image of her holding that giant dildo. And everyone thinks she's adorable. She's so cute, you know, with all her sexual stuff. And uh, oh, I thought, wow, this is, there's a level of, uh, uh, of contempt for young girls that are slut shamed if any of them work with any kind of sexual imagery and Jenna uh, Gribben will be the first to tie you, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just, why is that? I wish, this is Dr. Uh, Cassinia. This is something I think someone should be writing about why there's so much uh, that second guessing and that contempt for young girls working with sexual imagery, whereas old ladies can do anything they want. I'm going to send you some writing that I <laughs> um, do. You, Marilyn, do you know Samantha Nye's work by any chance? I don't. Not off that. I mean, maybe if I saw it. She's I'm a really not... amazing um, lesbian painter um, and actually paints uh, elderly queer people bathing around pools. Of course, I don't know about it. I, <laughs> I'd love to see that. You gotta send, send me the pictures. Yeah. I'm trying to, uh, I kind of zoned out because I'm trying to remember who, whether it was Andrew, maybe you can help me. Was it Laura Mulvey who said that there are three gazes? There's the female gaze, the male gaze, and then there is sort of a third gaze that is coming from like a spectator of pornography, right? See, I wouldn't know that at all. I'm not an intellectual at all. Um, I'm, I'm gonna think I this. I that's gonna, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I, that's right. that would yeah. be an interesting angle to, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. to approach your work, actually. Well, mm -hmm. that, and um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think like it's interesting how early you brought pornography in or like, or addressed it and excoriated for it. And it makes me think of even like Hannah Wilkie and like just yeah, the, yeah. the yeah, how many how many people tried to just use their own body and it became an issue, um, or like any 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 uh, non critical idea of desire was was such an issue within the art world for a while, and it seemed to kind of break. But it seemed like you and a lot of other artists had to get yelled at a lot uh, <laughs> for remember, trying it. I remember uh, um, when uh, Linda Biglis had the art forum ad. Broke art forum, <laughs> you know, her holding that giant dildo because she was this young, beautiful woman. I mean, it's just stunning to me how much that, you know, it's like the fear of power, the power of women own sexual agency. It's just such a fear for young women to own the power of sexual agency. And I mean, I, I shot Pamela Anderson because there was so much contempt for her. And I put her in the in the centerfold of Parquet because uh, but I saw this animal rights worker when it wasn't popular or trendy, who was picketing chicken, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the way they treated the chickens and how cruel the cruelty of uh, of industrial um, slaughter of animals, and uh, and that she had no pick no bones out. Listen, I make my money by being a pinup. And uh, I painted, you know, I really wanted to show her um, humanity. She was an empathetic person, huge animal rights activist, and also was not a singer or a dancer, but she was using power from her, the way she looked. She was the owner of it. She didn't have some Spengali like Marilyn Monroe had or like uh, Anna Nicole Smith or people that were devastated by uh, their own beauty and, and used uh, in a, in a uh, kind of ugly way. And uh, it's just a, such a huge uh, subject matter that no one talks about or writes about. 
I mean, there is there is a whole discourse that you know started in the seventies with like somebody like Carol Vance that really draws. Carol Vance her. was my hero. Oh, yeah. If I mentioned that name, no one here would know what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was, her book was Pleasure and Danger. Exactly. Exactly. I read yeah. that book and I went, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, and maybe let one. One thing kind of building off of this is maybe another way to look at these or something I'm interested in hearing you discuss is um, like you are stepping into the stream of images. You're working with people that are celebrities now, but might not be celebrities in a few years or like they're incredibly public, you know, like who's to say that Lady Gaga doesn't do anything in five years that completely changes our idea of her. You know, it's like artists that worked with Britney Spears 10 years ago. It's like you were purposefully addressing public people that their context of these paintings are bound to change, will change. It's like this anxious imagery and anxious person that you're attracted to, it seems like. Well, um, the, I, I swear to you though, somebody like Roxanne and Gloria, they were so confident. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, anxious for specifically in terms of like its meaning is going to just vibrate and shift and change. Like, I think there's a confidence to the people you're painting, but oh yeah, but, I, yeah. Like, my dealer said <clears throat> she really thought I should like think in terms of it tells a story putting the same putting certain people together in a room because the first batch of people was just who would pose for me. Not everybody said yes, you know, they didn't even know what I was going to do as a part. A lot of artists turned me down or said, uh, maybe later, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not, you know, not now I'm too busy or something like that. And uh, so I just went to the people I, like, it's, I want to do Tori Birch because she's does this at women empowerment. She's got this entire program that it's pretty uh, generous and I've, I've been a part of it and I've actually gone to the lectures that they do and she's a, one of the best powers of example of uh, women helping other women and like I want to go there and I want to make a portrait of the people that uh, I think are, 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 are a force for good and um, and I also want to re reclaim I hate that word but I want to reclaim the the people, the Monica Lewinsky's and the E. Jean Carroll's. You know, I I have I could paint. I mean, I've I've been offered to paint uh, Virginia Guffrey, and uh, but I've been but but I was told no, you can't do that because she made twenty one million dollars off of uh, that. So that I so said, why does that? She was seventeen years old. Why does that poison the well of Virginia Guffrey? Because she made some money over being trafficked at the age of 17 by Jeffrey Epstein for Princess Andrew. And I'm getting so much pushback from people. No, you can't do her. You can't do her. What is she doing now? She's not doing any good for other people. So is that going to be my criteria? I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't have the answers. I wish I could. I just don't have uh, even rules. You know, I'm attracted to this person or that person for different reasons. And I'm thrilled if they say yes, because most people don't want to get their portrait painted. <laughs> they don't? No. Surprised me. Does it? Yeah, a little. But no, they really, you know, yeah. I mean, I've been turned down as much as I've been, uh, you know, I, I, that I've gotten yeses. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd want mine painted. <laughs> No? Have you been asked? No one's ever asked. <laughs> um, I think the ending of the slideshow means that we have hit an hour and uh, I think we're going to move into a Q&A with the audience. Marilyn, thank you so much and I hope that we will continue this conversation and I'm going to send you some writing. <laughs> yes, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marilyn. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Ksenia. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, both you were very great questions. Really had me thinking. Thank you so, so much, Marilyn and Andrew and Cassania. This was an amazing conversation. Um, and we do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, the first question 
is from GE and uh, Carolyn will ask on his behalf. Yeah, thank you all so much for um, this conversation today. So uh, GE's question is, um, Marilyn, has your work always followed the idea that the eye creates what it doesn't see? Thanks. I, I sort of think of it like that, the, the eye craves what it doesn't see. So when, you know, I've, I've watched art movements, I'm old enough to see book move, art movements that lasted five years or longer. And I, what I saw was, uh, you know, they all become commodified, you know, even the punkest uh, uh, gestures become commercial 20 years later. And uh, I find that the eye is always going to want what it doesn't see. And that all the, the next, like, Rococo follows uh, neoclassicism. You know, you do crave what you're not looking, you know. And so I don't, maybe that's a, a very uh, tentative rule, rule of thumb. You know, the eye seems to crave what it doesn't, what it doesn't see. Because you can never say this is art. This is what art is, and it's only this, and it never will be anything but this. But a lot of people try to make that argument, don't they? I actually, I, I think, I, I mean, that the eye craving what it doesn't see, definitely, you know, because there's like you desire a lack. But I actually think that what the eye can see is uh, what you are looking at. I think Mary Kelly said this, that the field of vision is inherently is a field of desire, because if you are looking at something, it means that it is separate from you. You know, you're looking from a distance thus you desire it that's right? what I'm trying, that's my subject matter is always what you know is true but you've never seen a picture of it mm -hmm. so that's always the object of desire it's always outside of yourself but if you can see a picture of it it reaffirms you or something oh yeah that's true oh i believe that that's what only when i'm looking at art Thank you so much for that question, GE. And thanks, Marilyn. Um, our next question is from Matthew Biro. And Matthew, you should be able to unmute to ask. Got it. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful talk. And it was really uh, great to see some of the 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 really the newest work, the the elder sex, for example. Uh, I had a question about kind of the politics behind your um, use of pornography. I mean, one of the things that I think about when when I see your work is, you know, I'm I'm an art historian. I think a lot about kind of the history of images, things like that. And one of um, the laws that really controlled pornographic imagery in the United States was the uh, Comstock Act from 1873, which made it illegal to um, produce, distribute, exhibit, um, or possess immoral materials like obscene images or texts. But it also, this very same law also outlawed um, anything to prevent conception or procure an abortion, you know, any kind of birth control or you know, abortion material. And that's actually uh, the law they're calling on today to um, stop the mail distribution of um, uh, abortion pills in Republican states. Um, so how, you know, you're obviously you're using pornography critical and you're take critically and you're taking back um, some of the power there, but could you talk a little bit about, you know, what you were thinking um, your political attitudes that drew you to that um, and the type of responses you got and how that's changed over time? Well, what started it all for me was the what I think is a, is a, a real a rule. Nobody has politically correct fantasies. Right? Nobody. And uh, I thought, why can't women make images for their own power and amusement? And the women I quote, uh, Andrew Ross, uh, like we're, you know, he had an article about 
uh, I forgot the name of it, but he's an intellectual at NYU. And uh, um, Carol Vance, and there were just, Martha Wilson's on this, and she was one of the pro progenitors of everything we're talking about. She's, she's one of my heroes. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, uh, I thought, why, you know, what started, but politically, I guess it's political, but I saw Mike Kelly's work and I saw, this is what gave me the idea. I saw Mike Kelly was working with um, pathetic things like those stuffed toys that are in somebody's attic and he sewed them, he sewed them together to make paintings and he made stuffed animal sculptures, stuffed animal sculptures. And he had tables with candles melting. They're, they're like, uh, and then and then banners made out of felt. It was almost like, and I thought to myself, when I walked out of that show, it was such a brilliant show. If a woman artist made this work, nobody would pay any attention because she'd be working with crafts, sewing up stuffed animals, even though they were beat up stuffed animals or melting candles. It was this kind of crafty, uh, hippie, art and it's it was contemptible if a woman did it but if a guy did it it changed the meaning so i'm actually a mike kelly fan i'm not a fan of a lot of male artists but i i really like mike, mike kelly and to me his work actually did open up a space for feminism because it it is about that crisis of white masculinity in particular well, mall culture i always think of it as mall culture and whoever, whoever, who else got absolutely killed were, were Pruitt and Early because they were working with mall culture too. They were working with toxic, the idea of toxic masculinity and these cases of beers stacked. And so that was a, a prescribed time where you, you know, it's the same kind of uh, 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 censorship on the left at then as there is right now, censorship on the left. It's still censorship. And uh, like I said, we we it had a, but there's a really hard time for for all all of us to tolerate complexity. And I wanted to see what it looked like if a woman worked with hardcore images, cum shots. Because I knew about, you know, I always say I knew about Judy Bernstein and I knew about Carol Lee Steeman. There were hundreds of women working with sexual imagery. We were just underground betty betty tompkins lived down the street from me and she never showed me those paintings <laughs> her fucked paintings she was way ahead of all of us but uh I, we you know these are this is what happens though i think the earliest artists can't be seen in their time it has to be and that's when the internet came in sexual imagery for, for for all of us martha it was underground i mean there were all these stores you know on 42nd street or i had to go to porn stores uh, uh downtown in wall street or on 42nd street and this is what i always wanted to tell the um the women against pornography is that listen all you got to do is walk in the store Everybody freaks out when when women are in the store. I would go down an aisle and the aisle would clear. I thought they thought we were aging porn stars or something. <laughs> uh, but that's off, off the subject matter. Um, and uh, the politics of it were uh, to see if a woman had this like changed the meaning the way he changed the meaning. And uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer still to this day. Oh, and why I got criticized is because I think that idea of sexual imagery didn't exist in the popular culture. No one saw porn unless they went into these hidden stores, these subterranean uh, complexes. And now it's, you know, a flick of a computer. So an artist were the most isolated because they're in their studios all day working a lot, you know, and pornography was... Uh, Wow, it wasn't quite as fetishized as it is now. It was just fucking was the big deal. <clears throat> that was such a great question, question, Matthew. Thank you so much for that. Um, and if anyone else from the audience would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or send a message in the chat. Um, but I would love to ask you a question, Marilyn. Um, I'm wondering about 
you mentioned Photoshop and kind of your editing process. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. Like, how do you decide what or how to edit in a photo? Some, does it ever feel kind of like a slippery slope? Um, I guess I was thinking about the star tattoo image and you mentioned that you edited out the tattoos and I'm curious about how you make those choices and also how do you or do you ever consult with the sitters about that? Not really, I'm paying them. So um, so I'm using, you know, what I what they bring me, just like when the sitters, they come in and I want them to, I want all the people I ask to work with, I want them to show me who they are and I could find something. That is, that is what I think of as artists have talents. I have a gift for that. I have a gift for seeing where people are interesting for me. And, and, and I, I, it's not any kind of linear plan. I'm totally intuitive and, and it works for me. And I'm, why should I fight that? You know, and, and I have confidence in it now. I used to second guess myself. And I mean, I tried to throw away back in the eighties. Um, I tried to totally throw away the skill I had because I could draw anything. I could copy anything. And I tried to be an expressionist and I did massive amounts of drugs to try and loosen up because everyone said, loosen up, Marilyn, loosen up, you know? Yeah. Who cares about this photorealist shit? You know, it's, it's contemptible. And um, I, and I learned when I got out of rehab, Hey, this is what I got going for me. I got to figure out how to make art out of what my skill level is, which is something that came really easy. And as an artist, you know, we're told, oh, we got to challenge ourselves. We can't use what comes naturally or easy or organically to us. And um, so that's when I be, tried to become an expressionist because everybody around me was an expressionist and I was young enough that I wanted to be in the conversation. And so I could copy anything. I could copy expressionism. And, I, you know, when, they, when I had my retrospective, there was that whole chunk of work that I burned. I don't want anyone to ever see it. Because, yeah, I could create that gestural mark, but it looks like shit <laughs> from the people that really could do it, like Joan Mitchell or Carol Dunham, you know, they have that hand. I don't have that hand. I have the hand that could build up something over a long period of time and that, uh, that get pleasure from, um, from repetition to be able to build, you know, these, these surfaces. And uh, so I had to trust my... Uh, gift and now I do and now I totally do because I'm, I'm I've got enough experience that it worked for me whereas when I was using my brain to try and make art to fit which was pure minimalism or expressionism I was bad at both of those is that an answer yeah definitely thank you so much that was that was really great um our final question is from Fong, and Chloe will ask on Fong's behalf. Hi, Marilyn, and hi, Ksenia and Andrew. That was amazing. Thank you so much for that dialogue. Um, I'm going to read Fong's question. Fong, first of all, says hello, Marilyn. Um, so he asks what you think of the late Alfred Leslie or Malcolm Morley, Gerhard Richter, Lisa Yaskavage, John Curran, in terms of being in the figurative tradition, as well as their invention of images and painterly techniques. How do you look to other influences and artists in your work? Oh, they're all my heroes. Yeah, I think they're all terrific. I, uh, I, I, um, uh, Malcolm Morley was a god to me. Mm. Yeah. And uh, especially early, this, he had a show at the Brooklyn Museum that was just such a knockout. I still have the book from it, uh, the catalog from it. Uh, I, I, what were the names? I remember Malcolm. Oh, Leslie. Yeah, they were all my teachers, you know. And then I saw, you know, Lisa and John, they came out of Yale and they really had something new to say. And, uh, you know, I'm a voracious consumer. So I'm gonna steal from them, every one of them. I'll add one that Fong didn't mention, but um, is my own is Deanne Arbus. 
How do you think about Deanne's work? You know, I didn't know it was Deanne. Is that how you say it? Uh, Deanne. Uh, well, you know, I, I didn't see the work really. I, even though she was somebody that came to my school and saw my photos of my mother, my drug addict mother, and praised them. Mm. Uh, but I didn't know who she was because I was a lowly undergraduate. I wasn't allowed to be with the uh, the the, the uh, visiting artists, you know. And when she killed herself, and I saw her work in Life magazine, and when she was, I guess, seventy one when I was in grad school, and uh, I, you know, I met her, and uh, I I thought she was a phenomenon being in Florida in Gainesville in this silver mini dress and silver sandals and huge boobs and no bra and what a hot girl she was I thought how was she gonna go into 7-eleven and get some milk <laughs> I was I was so in awe of the way she carried herself and how confident she was but I only saw her from a distance hmm. and um I you know she's brilliant she's another person that fucked art history just you know moved it and if you move it in any way, in shape, or form, I'm in love with you. <clears throat> I mean, there is someone that that Arbus is someone who um, sought out unconditional beauty, but then presented it in a way that did seem to perhaps, you know, yeah. there's criticism. Yeah. Her, yeah. Uh, that what is that back then? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Chloe um, and Fong, for that great question. Uh, I think that, that was a nice note to end on. And we have a tradition at the rail of ending our community events with a reading. Um, and today I'm thrilled to welcome Drew Ziba to the stage. Drew Ziba writes between fiction and criticism. Recently, their work has been in Fence, Document Journal, Pin Up, New York Magazine, and the monograph Steve Shapiro, Andrew, Andrew War, Andy Warhol, and Friends. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Drew. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. And thanks to everyone at The Rail and um, to Marilyn. Um, I'm going to read just a couple unrelated little prose pieces. When they are distressed, they recall that once they were cradled. A distant voice tells them they wish to be cradled again, to be held in both a present lover's and a former's lap while one feeds them from his unforthcoming nipple and the other slaps their ass. Probably the former's nipples. They're hairless. His surface effuses as little as possible. He instead stewards their virgin sculpturehood. They nor he nor I believe in miracles. Bleeding eyes and milky bosom do not belong to God. Even as come, they never see. It is always placed inside, a wafer on the tongue. His hope and their hopelessness mold green, blue, and furry on one another's palettes. Some days I, and I mean I, the writer I, wake to the repeated roar of planes. Each sounds different enough to sound the same. I guess the flight paths change to be over my head once or twice a month. This must be what we call fairness. Everyone has their turn, which is what we call hope, or I mean death, by which I mean not decay, but certainty. I am not certain of what I want, which means I have no projection of where I am going. He FaceTimes them so frequently that they forget what to say. He calls, he asks after test results, he gets lied to, he gets told the truth. We are dying no more or less than anybody else. Everyone gets their turn. We are dying less than everybody else, living forever as images born of CMOS sensors and X-rays and four-fan drones and a magnetic re resonance imaging and ultrasound wands, till that data disappears too. It will. Forever is a short distance to cross, but a heavy weight to carry. Call it myth. I am opposed to magic. I am begging for an iconoclast. They are begging for a way out. You might be begging for thought as something other than language, a hole in the center of your body, the body in black and white, lost image. You will find the hole, finger it and discover neither pain nor blood. They will not be so lucky. Their cuticle will sour oxide red. They will beg for morphine and love and health insurance, gods that don't exist. They will beg for hope. 
They are begging him to come over, crying that they do not want to be alone, crying on the street, lying, saying I am fine. Striations of stretch marks along, elongate the curves of his upper ass, a slightly lighter shade than the rest of him. At the beach, he always wears shorts, not briefs like most people we know, even though day to day he mostly wears women's pants, and I wonder what this says about him. He says to blow him a kiss with my asshole as I'm bent on the white Ikea chair across the living room, and I comply, trying not to fart. The puckered knot of my insides. I'm swollen. Is this love? Not surrender, but becoming first person, a container for someone else. How does that pussy feel? Good. Stop talking. Squeeze. I feel a change in the angle he's hinging against me from. I assume he's filming with his phone. When he sends me these videos, I pretend to like them. Seeing myself makes me want to vomit. My simultaneous third personality, everyone does ketamine, so now it's cut and impure. A decade of distance between my first dose and this one, we are dancing in a dark space swollen with high BPM sounds and somebody is yelling in my ear about somebody else. I don't know who they're talking about, but not along. I feel his hand close around me. Outside the party, I squat, trying not to crease my shoes, and he pulls out his cock. We are partially hidden behind an aluminum frame that juts from a building on the dead end street. The building once housed lo lo sorry, the building once housed luxury apartments, though the top three floors burned and nobody bothered to fix them. The bars stay open. Headlights trace their ways towards the street and I stand up, stand close to cover him. His breath is icy, scentless. The car oozes past. Once it's gone, I turn around and unbutton my pants. He spits on his hand and rubs his palm between my ass cheeks and I brace myself. We are not supposed to be doing this. We are disagreeing again, lying on the floor of the basement of his building to keep cool and to hide from the dog his roommate is watching, which I'm allergic to. There's no reason for us to go, he's insisting. I know he can't be that mad. He's toying with my fingers, which is to say I know he must is being serious. Did you want to live together, I ask? Once, not anymore, he replies. I wouldn't admit that this hurts me because I know that it's my fault and I don't want to be accountable to that. And anyway, he continues, I wanted to live together here. There's nothing really for us here. I mean, there's no good reason to be here in particular, I say. There's no good reason to go either, he counters. He's right. Everywhere is the same. The same shops closed for good. The same desperate ones open. The same burnt rubber smelling air. The same images flashing on advertising screens, the same wrong passwords, the same magic. Don't blame me for your fear of your own grief, he says, turning to kiss me. I thrum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drew. That was really beautiful. Um, and thank you again to Marilyn and Ksenia and Andrew. We'd also like to thank um, Nicholas from Salon 94 and also Mariana from Maryland Studio for their help in preparing for today. And thank you to the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program, making these daily conversations possible and supporting our growing archive, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, The Rail has been a platform for arts, culture, and politics in our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Check the chat for a link to donate to support The Rail. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Michael Brunson and David Levi Strauss on the book, David Smith, The Art and Life of a Transformational Sculptor. We'll conclude tomorrow with a reading by Paul Ebenkamp. Um, thanks to you all for tuning in. It's been such a great afternoon and you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Great to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it you. Great. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Tanya, thanks. Great Tanya. reading. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe, at MTTR. Thank you, Drew, for the reading.